Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me are Adventure Editor Crafty. Hello. And the editor of all editors, <coughs> Mal. Oh, um, he's the big cheese. Hi, James. He's and the big cheese. <laughs> this week, morning, we're, dis- Mal. we're discussing the Ford Ranger Raptor rival that Toyota won't build. Um, we'll look at three pieces of fresh metal recently occupying the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with the dear leader's dubious crypto capers in this week's Must Watch. Uh, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. And first of all, we are going to talk about this Ranger Raptor rival that um, our very own Justin Hilliard is uh, putting that, that Toyota won't build. Well, it is built. Um, it's called the Hilux AT35, and it's by a mob called Arctic Trucks. And Justin has discovered that this much modified uh, Hilux is sold through to Toyota dealerships in the UK. So there's a semi kind of official connection here and he's putting it that, well, why couldn't they be sold in Australia? And it is a pretty interesting vehicle. Um, there's not so much done to the powertrain, but it's all about the suspension. And as the name implies, Arctic trucks uh, claim that they're able to make vehicles that will survive in Arctic conditions. So big floaty tires, special wheels, suspensions that are tuned for that kind of stuff. Uh, Crafty, do you think there's a market for, for that kind of vehicle if, if we had a word to create the connection here? <laughs> Is that a rhetorical question, James? It could be. It could be. I, think, I think Mal and I have already split the difference to go in for a deposit on one. So I think we're... Uh, we're yeah, <laughs> I'll have the front. You can have the back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Well, the back, um, you can make the trail around them. You know, oh, the exactly. Car for Hilux trailer. Fantastic. Exactly. Um, I'm not so... I'm, I'm a big fan of it, but I'm not so much of a big fan on cold weather. So I would love for it to come down here. Um, Mel would know it would be unreal on uh, sandy places like Stockton or Fraser you know, the Simpson Desert, something like that. Uh, yeah. This this sort of thing represents the future, and it's already kind of here in Australia because a lot of vehicles over here have been sort of retrofitted uh, from standard into, you know, aftermarket beasts. So, you know, pretty much vehicles that can go anywhere with, um, you know, with those chassis that are purpose-built for hardcore work and play and that suspension system and, and you know, tyres to match. Like those uh, those BFG uh, KO2s uh, are well proven on yep. standard vehicles, um, you know, like the, the Raptor and the, and the Ranger. Um, and uh, at that different size, you know, perfect for, for you know, that sort of well, crazy... Well, they, st- they, they have a go at the chassis as well in that they, they basically re-engineer um, the ladder frame chassis. They reinforce the inner arches um, on the bodywork just to make sure that it can can cop a beating. And, mm. and I suppose, despite the temperature variance, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Arctic conditions to outback desert, it's kind of the same torture test in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's clearly a thoroughly developed product. They've been doing it for years. But, uh, yeah, it's I think not an the, afterthought, is it? No. The, and, you know, we first came, I think the world first came to know Arctic Trucks via the vehicle behind me, yeah. uh, which was the star of uh, the Top Gear special all those years ago. Was it, was it the North Pole I drove A to? while back, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it was an AT38, mm. uh, for the record, with 38-inch tyres. Mm. Uh, but um, I think it's fair to say the number one reason it's not going to come to Australia in, in any official capacity uh, would be Australian design rules, which are quite stringent. And, you know, this car might meet Australian design rules, but mm. it costs a lot of money to gain ADR compliance. Right. Yeah. And that's money that Toyota's, you know, likely to be reluctant to spend given a relatively small volume of cars. Yeah. Um, and Arctic Trucks, you know, might want to set up shop in Australia, but uh, would and they would then have to, to handle the ADR compliance and the cost associated with it. That's a great point. I, yeah. I suppose they build it on top of what, the Toyota in the UK calls the Invincible X. Mm. Um, that's the model that they base it on. And mm. then um, that's the flagship, um, Hilux in the UK. Then they do all their stuff. They, they put the suspension in there. Um, what is it? It's Bilstein performance dampers. Um, yeah. they, they lift it, obviously, uh, quite oh, substantially. Yeah. And, yeah. and they charge like wounded bulls. You know, They're, I think it's a premium of about 40000 Australian dollars. 
yeah. um, on top of your truck to get it set up in this way. Yeah. Mm. So it's it's a lot, a lot of money. Um, but Mel, you know, thanks for crapping all over. A man can dream, you know, that sort of thing that we'd actually get it here. But uh, you know, you're Maybe. always the voice. You're always the voice of reason, mate. <laughs> Maybe if we get it in the two halves, it's a way of, of <laughs> yeah, that's you know, right. sliding exactly. under the radar. That's I mean, they're it. bringing in as parts. It's part, right. honestly, sir. It's yeah. part. It's that's only got one number plate on it because it's only like half the vehicle. <laughs> So, um, so while we may not see it, I mean, the, these things are sort of going on already. Perhaps not to that um, to that sort of nth degree that this thing represents. But um, you know, I mean, yeah, it would be a, a, a tiny market. It's a niche within a niche. Um, but man, oh man, wouldn't you love to be uh, cruising around in one of those things? But I suppose yeah. as, the, as the general flavour of things uh, goes, the Ranger Raptor has set the tone and prove that there's definitely an appetite out there, um, despite the fact that the, the engine is not hugely modified. In fact, it's no. a relatively modest yeah. uh, powertrain. The extra capability um, off-road is really appealing and the way the truck looks. So whether it's this, um, this Arctic vehicle or whether it's something else, um, I think the market is definitely ready for more of that. Yeah, well, uh, Australia has certainly shown an appetite for even mildly sort of aftermarket modded vehicles from the showroom. So things that people yeah. don't have to go and source the gear themselves for, you know, bull bars or nudge bars, light bars, you know, that sort of thing, uh, storage platforms on the roof, you know, even awnings on the side. And, you know, th this is the way standard vehicles are, are heading. And again, it's a yeah. niche within a niche, but uh, geez, you see plenty of them out there. Yeah. And there's a, there is a degree of modification you can do without having to to get engineering certification to, yeah. to retain yeah. your rego and insurance and other important things like that. Yeah. Uh, but it's only a degree. And I yeah. think a really good example of that threshold would be the uh, the Navara Warrior, mm. uh, where, you know, Arctic Trucks make an AT32 uh, Navara for Europe, I think. Mm. But, like, that car just does would not meet Australian design rules. But yeah. the Warrior... Yeah. Right. Has just walks that tightrope of yeah. just underneath requiring recertification, yeah, uh, and and pulls it off in in a pretty impressive fashion. Oh, absolutely, it's yeah. Great. For has sure. that tough truck look, and you know, there's proper tires and a bit of suspension lift, etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, these, um, this mob this mob's even re re geared the front and rear dips. Yeah, um, yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is a pretty <laughs> uh, pretty fine level of of modification. Yeah. Um, what else have they done? They've extended the fender flares. Um, enlarged and strengthened the side steps, mud flaps, a rear height bar, yeah. integrated uh, two-inch multifunction <clears> receiver <throat> hitch, yeah. um, all, of, all of that. I think if they didn't do the final drive ratios, you know, you might be crawling down the hill. You might be. Third gear. <laughs> you, might be. <laughs> you might be. <laughs> With about a a Hilux AT35 doing 60 kilometres an hour. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, five inches of, about five inches of extra, you know, circumference, uh, not, sorry, diameter per corner. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I wonder if if those you know heavy duty modifications though could have some appeal to you know commercial operators that that really do need something that is going to work in remote areas and and talk about a niche that's that's very small, um, but uh, there are certain special needs out there that it might meet as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. that certainly happens. I mean, how many of those uh, seventy series based buses do you see out in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, uh, and yeah. even. Even on beaches like Stockton Beach, you know, yeah. heavily modified that would have cost a lot of money to build, but you know, specifically built for the task based on uh, off the shelf vehicles. For yeah. sure. Well, remote, you can see the value for remote area work, search and rescue units, you know, vehicle yeah. recovery units in the Simpson or yeah. or on Fraser or on the East Coast, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but again, yeah, they've they've gone hardcore with everything else, but they've left, uh, you know, pretty much the engine and everything else uh, as is. And it's also worth pointing out that this is the base model Arctic Trucks Hilux. Mm. You know, they also do a 38, 44, and then if <laughs> four wheels aren't enough, they do a 44 by six. <laughs> nice. Uh, and, you know, it, it would be lovely to see that suiting the requirements of, uh, you know, commercial operators. In yeah. 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 Australia. And it's interesting, I was going to Pretty say cool. you're extremely well qualified, Crafty, of course, to talk about recovery vehicles because you have had to call on them <laughs> on, on so many <laughs> occasions. So you know exactly what's required there. 
Uh, apparently, I'm a gold card uh, member, mate. Um, yeah, I think for, you're for custom, any... <laughs> custom platinum, aren't you? The... For any vehicle <laughs> breakdown service whatsoever, I think. Yeah. And you, you don't just dial H-E-L-P, do you? you know? <laughs> no, that's right. I don't right. ask what I'm... word you dial. <laughs> when they see that, when they see that number, they just go high crafty. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah it's a, that's right. Yeah. It's a we'll first the, name basis. We'll be there in a second. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, exactly. we'll send out the chopper. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. The, the air crane. Yes. All right. Well, look, it would be uh, fantastic to hear what uh, people who are listening or watching uh, make of all this, whether or not they be uh, drawn towards a pricey but exceptionally well-engineered um, and rather extreme version of the Hilux or something like it. What do you make of it? Do you think it would, despite notwithstanding Mal's valid points about ADRs and, and yes, it is very pricey, is it something you'd be drawn towards? Where would you see it fitting into the automotive landscape here? It'd be great to, to hear from you. So uh, I think, do you, re do you reckon we're covered off on that, guys? Yeah, uh, Mel's just busy putting in his bank details at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing right. my uh, engineering degree. Uh, yeah, so to try and get it clear. Remotely, yeah, so I can clear it myself. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, when you've got that three-digit security number on the back of the car dialed, yeah. Mel, if you could yeah. just fill us in about the, the car that you've been driving recently, um, it's in your possession over a longer term. Can you tell us what it is, please? So from one big truck to another uh, perceptibly big truck, I have the new Hyundai Palisade uh, for an extended period of time. And it is the big Hyundai that uh, we've all been waiting for. It's got eight seats. It's all also available in a seven-seat configuration, but mine has eight seats. So uh, three across each back row. Uh, the one I have is the top spec Highlander in diesel mm. uh, and all, throw all those things together. And the list price is $75,000, which turns out to be about 82 on the road. So it's at the upper echelons for a, a mainstream brand, uh, but it's very well equipped. It comes with lots of bells and whistles. Um, it's, it's not as big as you might think it's, Marginally bigger than the Santa Fe and, you know, shares a lot of its uh, mechanicals, uh, a, lot of, a lot of its fundamentals under the skin with the Santa Fe. But uh, it's, not, um, it's not giant, you know, Cadillac Escalade big, uh, but it's nicely bigger. Uh, okay. And I haven't, uh, haven't had the chance to put three people across the back seat yet. In fact, uh, my load area is usually full of prams and porticots and do you do you want to put them across the seat, Mal, or do you want to actually sit them upright, like the, normal uh, passengers? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. Allow me to clarify, James. Upright across the back seat Thank in you. the Thank in the you. seating yeah. position, okay. safely belted. Um, yes, with headrests correctly adjusted, of course. Anyway, uh, but the the other the other great side effect of the big uh, uh, sorry SUV is the, the massive load area. Uh, which is very handy. And, you know, I found that uh, when we went away last uh, time, so I've just prior to this, I'd had the Skoda Kodiak, uh, which is on the smaller end of seven seat SUVs. But what I found is that uh, with the Palisade, the key difference for me meant that uh, we could fit all our stuff for a weekend away, plus also stick the bikes in the back wow. uh, without having wow. to resort to a pod on yeah. the roof or a bike rack yeah. on the back. Yeah. Um, Keeps them out of the rain, keeps them secure, yep. uh, just handy. And look, you know, it is a big car and, you know, won't fit in all uh, garages, but uh, it's very nice to have the option now. The, th um, the thing that I picked up, Mel, just on that storage capacity, I know when our own Nadal uh, tested the Palisade, she found that with all the rows of seats up, there was still actually a reasonable amount of storage space there, you know, roughly equivalent to a small hatch's worth of load space, even yeah. when you've got all the seats up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's usable space and, you know, you could, uh, you know, it's kind of, you're then able to go and do the weekly shopping with eight passengers still yeah. on board. Um, yes. You know, you wouldn't do a weekend away with eight passengers, but you could go do the shopping. Wow. Um, you know, yes. Yeah. With eight passengers, a, they unload and, and the woolly oh, people just start seeing stars in their eyes. It just what? makes it so much easier to get those bags in from the car. Um, now, interestingly, the Palisade we have in Australia has been on sale in America for a few years, so it's not quite as fresh as the uh, recently facelifted Santa Fe, even though they arrived on the market at the same time. So the Palisade 
still has the torque converter eight speed auto, doesn't have the, the new dual clutch unit in the Santa Fe that's also in the Sorento, uh, but also the 2.2 litre diesel engine is still the iron block version, uh, which we had in the pre facelift Santa Fe, et cetera. Okay. Um, not the okay. alloy block version with a different bore and stroke and uh, a bunch of other little things. Okay. But, but the same power and torque outputs. Um, but so far, I haven't actually crunched any at the pump fuel figures, but I've seen on the on a steady highway run, run I've seen 7.5 litres per 100 kilometres on the dash. The official combined figure is 7.3. So that's, that's kind of on the money from what we'd expect. Um, I get the feeling I'm going to see about nine uh, around, around town general use combined, real world, uh, whereas I saw 8.5 from the Santa Fe with the same engine in okay. 2018. So that's kind of on the money, and it's yep. pretty good for such a big vehicle. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the Palisade story to date. Fantastic. So that'll be ongoing, and people that want to, um, you know, pick up a bit more detail and keep up with the story as it, as it unfolds, um, you'll be updating it regularly. You'll find all the details on carsby.com.au. <laughs> Mel, just a really quick question. Do you think um, a lot of people who buy dual cab utes actually want, or they should get something like the Palisade? Like, do you think people are off, you know, like they fall in love with, the, you know, the romantic notion of having a dual cab ute, Yep. but they actually need, or well, their family needs something like the Palisade or the, or yeah. the Carnival. I reckon there'd be a few people that would uh, would think, oh, five seats, beauty, massive tray, that's that's good enough as a boot. But I think the first time they go shopping with five people on board and therefore put the shopping in the tray yeah. and get home with a tray full of assorted oh, oranges and yeah. fruit everywhere. And soaked yeah. if it's raining. Correct. And soaked yeah. if it's raining. Yeah. Yeah. You'd soon wake up. You'd, you'd have a bit of a wake-up call. But, you know, there's, <laughs> there's ways around that canopies. Of course, covers. yeah. You know, the, of course, the compartmentalization options within yeah. the tray, uh, but it's also you know it's a bit annoying lifting it, you know, reaching up into a tray if you're yeah. uh, of diminutive, diminutive stature like myself. But a, a yeah. palisade's going to be more comfortable too, you know. Um, oh, far more civilized, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And it's it's you know I, I liken it to you know when you go and buy a a couch for your family, you don't go buy a couch that feels like you're driving a racing seat or you know, it feels like a park bench. You buy something that's as comfortable as possible that you can, you know, comfortably fall asleep on and, you know. But not while driving. That's your focus. Well, that's, I no, was gonna say not that you want to fall asleep in a Palisade, but <laughs> I'll get to you. Uh, not that you want to fall asleep in the Palisade, but, it, you know, you, it, it's a family car that you... Yeah, you oh, absolutely. Fast. You, you, know, yeah. you might sit on the highway at 110, but you're never yeah. carving corners. Yeah. You'd prefer it to be more like the family couch than... A yeah. racing car and the palisade and, delivers that in yeah. spades and for long road trips and stuff like that to you know keep the grumpiness down to yeah you know a minimum yeah yep. absolutely yep. sorry james what was that about uh, no nothing no no let's move on let's move on thank <laughs> you sorry. thank you uh thank you very much mel <laughs> my and pleasure james crafty you've been in an interesting ford product which has emerged recently can you fill us in on that please I have. Uh, I've been in the Ford Ranger FX4 Max. Speaking of dual cab utes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I thought I'd lead into that uh, smoothly. Um, and it is interesting. I'm not going to give any spoilers uh, because the review is not up yet. That, that's a, a, a week or so away in the next seven days. Um, Your cockatiel seems excited. though. <laughs> Can you hear him? <laughs> is it a cockatiel? <laughs> He loves a good podcast, mate. Yeah, I, I think it's about to squeaky, I thought you had a squeaky chair. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a stress ball that squeaks. It sounds like a cockatiel, Mal. So I'm, uh, I'm sorry to hear you stressing. <laughs> am, uh, sorry to interrupt. Am, am I going to have to make sure that we credit the cockatiel when we go live with this? No. Maybe. maybe. Well, hold, on, I, hold on. I can get him wheeled out. <gasps> oh, here we go. Fantastic. World first cockatiel on podcast. Now, uh, we'll also have to get those talent release forms handy as well. What's the bird's name, uh, Crafty? Hold on. I can't hear <laughs> Would you just look at it? <laughs> this is great. <sighs> live TV, everybody. Back live. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, he just fired up. Just kept, <laughs> he thought I was talking to him. <laughs> what's, what's the cockatiel's name, Crafty? Is it Richard Keel? 
That's it. You know. yeah. 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 It wasn't he so. Jaws in um Yeah. <laughs> no, he's the- um my <clears throat> he's my boys and he likes Tinker, which is like an art program on the computer. So he's called Tinky. Tinky, oh, there you good. go. Very good. But Great he lost stuff. his right. he lost his parrot about a year ago and he's been devastated. So but we held off. But anyway, let's get back into the I can we see we held it. off for a year. Oh, that yeah, might yeah. be its own podcast, Crafty and Tinky. <laughs> wow, I would listen to that. Wow. I didn't Spin know off. it because uh, he got yeah he got quite energetic. Or Crafty loves Tinky like Joni loves ah, Crafty. Yeah. Yeah. Loves loves Tinky. Loves Tinky. <laughs> I would totally listen to that. <laughs> and watch, it's just getting it's just getting better. It is. Anyway, getting, Ford Ranger Crafty. Ford it's Ranger. getting it's getting better, but weird. Yes, JC, I've been in the uh, Ford Ranger FX4 Max. Seamless. Yes, that's right, uh, which kind of sits above the XLT and below the Ranger Raptor. It's it's an interesting uh, vehicle. I won't spoil anything here because the review uh, will be up in the next seven days oh, or give so. Us some, give us some hints. Oh, I'll give you some hints. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, it's, it looks cool. Um, it looks cool, and it's got all the good stuff sort of underneath. They've uh, they've put Fox Racing shocks on it, uh, as worn by the Raptor. It's got um, BFG all terrains. Those KO twos we mentioned um, about oh, the on this thing. Oh, yeah, on fantastic. this thing, uh, yep. diff- different size. These are two six fives. I think the Raptors are two seven five, um, but uh, KO twos nonetheless, and they're a really good all terrain tire. Uh, Kind of a nice balance between being very aggressive and yet not too bad on road. Some people have complained about the noise, but I don't, I, I didn't really pick up on that. I didn't mind it. Um, okay. And beyond that, um, it's got a whole bunch of styling things like the massive Ford uh, branding on the front. It's got some FX4 Max branding inside, which looks kind of cool. It's a bit of a weird mix inside with hard plastics everywhere. So it's trying to be a bit work UT, yep. but also the seats are kind of a suede leather. Uh, mix, uh, which look good. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's got Fox Racing shocks, all terrain tyres. It's got a wider wheel track. Yep. Um, and, and, the, uh, and the rims they've put on it look pretty handy too. Yeah, they're, they're quite yeah, a, a handsome yeah. design. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, I'm not usually a big fan of, of, of jazzy rims, but uh, yeah, they're kind of nice. And I think it's, it was a dark sort of graphite uh, yep. grey on yeah. our test vehicle. Yeah, Mal. I'm just laughing at jazzy rims. <laughs> jazzy um, rims. <laughs> but I, I think it's amazing. Ford is doing a really good job of filling in every little tiny yeah. gap in the Ranger lineup. You know, if you if you thought of it as a oh. ruler, it's not just centimetres. They've got all the little millimetre yeah. yeah. covered. And know. it's something I say, um, uh, and again, JC, you'll have to sit by your computer waiting for my video to go live. Um, I know as usual. Do, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but I do say at the st- yeah there's something for everyone um, and you got to yeah you got to admire that Mel you are spot on um, we had a lot of fun it's it's very capable uh, off road um, it, it's it's not quite a raptor it's kind of a raptor uh, wannabe which you know mm. I guess you expect because it doesn't go all out um, it does still have leaf springs at the back so it's right. it's still again trying to be a a work vehicle that can tow 3,500 kilograms, whereas a Raptor can only do uh, 2.5 tonnes. And have um, a decent payload. Too. And it's got, yeah, it's got a, a 223 kilograms more payload. So it's Than the nine, Raptor? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 981. Right. So, and that makes a big difference if you're going to use it, you know, even even for a Bunnings bloody pick up a timber or whatever, dirt, yep. whatever. Sausages. Um, <laughs> sausages processed, That's a lot of sausages. Processed meats. Um, mm. Small uh, yeah, um, it it does have um, the side steps are, are kind of a non-slip uh, graphite arrangement. I wasn't real keen on them, but they look more pronounced than what they prove to be when you're going through ruts and everything. I, I thought right. we'd catch a few here and there, and but um, but they're actually yeah yeah they're actually tucked away quite nicely. So while it's not as hardcore as the Raptor, it's a little bit more hardcore than something like the XLT. Uh, I did enjoy it, but again, for the full review, uh, cool. go to carsguide.com.au in a few days. I was I was going to say, to your point, Mel, about Ford filling in the little gaps in the Ranger range, um, you've got a car that's been around for 10 years, uh, pretty much in its current form. 
And September, Ford, it'll be 10 years. 10 yeah. years. So Fair Ford, um, you know, has copped a bit of criticism for you, you're a one mate car company. You, well, you've got the Ranger and you've got a Mustang and w- what else is there kind of thing. Yeah. But I think it's a, a decision that says, well, let's just play to our strength. We've got a, we've got a hot product that has really come up and is challenging Hilux, you know, at the top of the market. Well, let's just uh, do what we can with it. I think in it's some ways, uh, pretty good. Yeah. And in some ways it, it does feel like a, like an aged platform, like, uh, you know, across the, the models. But, yeah, they're pretty cluey. Um, and, yeah, a lot of people will like it. Um, yep. And uh, Another yeah. interesting option in the, <laughs> Ranger, in the Ranger story. And ADR compliant. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Oh, and now again, that's ADR the, Flynn. Yeah. And sorry, I just needed to mention that that um, – that's that's dual cab only, four wheel drive only, and it's got the two liter uh, bi turbo diesel wow. engine, which is which is fine in that package. Um, I mean, I I like their their three point two, um, and we've driven all you know most variants with you know most engines in across all kinds of different terrain, and I'm still I'm still impressed with that with that two liter how it goes. Very good. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Crafty. I'll um, finish off with the car that I've been driving. Mel, I know you had seat time in this one as well, so um, please feel free to chime in. But it's a Mazda 3 sedan. It's a G25 GT. Um, And so that means it's a 2.5-litre four-cylinder, naturally aspirated, uh, 139 kilowatts, 252 newton metres, but that peak torque comes at about 4,000 RPM. So there's your Atmo engine factor there. Six-speed auto, front-wheel drive, just a bit under $35,000 before you put it on the road. And um, I, ha- I drove it for a couple of days and I found the ride to be good, the dynamics, uh, as is the case with each of the, the current Mazda 3s, in my opinion, were very good. Um, it's well finished. Um, on this level, you get some nice leather trim. And a it's tricky... Second from the top to GT. Second from the top. So Stina this, this trim one. where it's perforated, you get this hint of red under the perfor- perforations, which is a classy... Classy touch, I thought. Um, decent rear space, and it's well equipped, particularly in terms of safety. You know, Mazda has gone to town um, on safety, and this car is no exception. On the on the not so uh, good side of the ledger, I just found this one pretty uninspiring uh, to look at inside and out. And I'm I'm a fan of the Mazda three. Others aren't, but I'm I'm I like the way the car looks as a hatch and as a sedan. But this one was a, a grey colour, as was the interior, and it was just kind of unrelentingly grey. And maybe I was just um, overcome by that. I think I think Mazda's signature sole red colour, that very deep multi-layer application paint that, that you see so often on Mazda products, has a lot to answer for because this car looked quite, um, you know, demure by comparison. And also I did notice that that torque coming in so high, you get spoiled by turbo engines having so much uh, pulling power at relatively mm. low revs. And this one, you found yourself hunting for a bit of acceleration because it's just that bit higher in the rev range. Where, where do you sit on it, Mel? How did you find it? Uh, I think the, yeah, I agree that the grey, you know, doesn't pop as well as the red. But, you know, thankfully you have the choice of colour when you buy one. Um, but it's it's bold. It's a bold uh, choice for Mazda to push the grey. You know, it's kind of we did red, now we're doing grey. Yeah. And um, for us, it's you know a little frustrating that all the press vehicles seem to be grey at the moment because mm. you know you photograph them, they just sort of disappear into the background. They do. Um, but you know, on a motor show stand where it's rotating and beautifully lit, and you know, it can look fantastic. And also in the press photography, you know, easy colours to keep clean too. Right. Um, but uh, no, I, I'm quite a fan of the current three. It, um, you know, they they don't fit into people's lives as well as the SUVs. It seems, you know, or, or you know, people the general populace is craving for SUVs, but hmm. as to has those too. Hmm. But uh, for those who still want a small sedan, I think it's nicely proportioned. It yeah. doesn't look like the sedan version of the hatch. You know, it's its own vehicle. True. Uh, and the hatch is quite bold in its design, in that it's kind of got that alpha esque rear yep. three-quarter view and that really thick C pillar. And this one's um, a little more conservative. Yeah. Conservative, but not conservative in the not, not conservative in the way that the Corolla sedan is conservative. Sure. So it's nice to have kind of, you know, yep. a bunch of uh, things to choose from. And you know, anyway, people still buy small sedans. I thought it was nice dynamically. It steers nicely. It's very comfy, you know, rides really well, but I just didn't find anything that 
as I was walking towards it, I wasn't particularly excited to drive the car. <laughs> you know what I mean? If that's part of your criteria that you want to have a, a fun drive and feel a bit of a, a buzz each time you head towards the car, this one left me feeling just a bit neutral about things. That's all. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, I think now we will move on to feedback from our last show last week, which was all about the rise of the super utes. Um, and our old mate TGV, the very fast train, um, reminded us that as for the GR Hilux, let us not forget the Hilux TRD, which was a fail from Toyota. Now, I suppose that means which TRD Hilux you're talking about, because as far as I recall, there was one in the noughts, um, late noughties, uh, about 2008, and then there was one Got much more era. recently in, in 2017, which was a, a kind of dress-up pack. But Yeah, they Arthur, had a couple you, of nudges, didn't they? Yeah, would you consider the TRD Hilux a failure? I still see, you know, one or two around. Sorry, go, Mal, because apparently your name's also crafty. <laughs> Why, thank you. Uh, I, I, look, it's probably fair to say that the earlier version was a failure. You know, it was quite expensive. Uh, it was kind of what we all want now, but it came too soon. You know, it was, yeah. They kind of, yeah. You know, performance. Ahead of uh, their time. Yeah, yeah but a yeah. bit expensive. Yeah. Yeah, we weren't quite there yet. Um but the, the other one, I think, was just a – the other one, I think, functionally, was just an experiment from the marketing department. They put on a you know, yeah. off-the-shelf kit to see yeah. – to test, test the waters for the, uh, um, yeah. the, the rugged Rogue and Rugged X that we've you know, seen more recently. Yeah. Uh, and it was only 1,000, I think, of the, the latter right. TRD. Okay. And so, you know, they all sold and you see them around. You can pick them by that, that bright red uh, bash plate under the front. <laughs> so I think they sold a few yeah. bash plates out of it. I reckon so, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. All right. Well, TGV went on to say um, that he's still not a fan of the two-litre uh, turbo diesel that's in the Ranger Raptor. And he doubts that Ford Australia has any pull with HQ I mean, offering 2.3-litre two four-cylinder turbo petrol, let alone the 2.7-litre V6 twin-turbo petrol for Australia and New Zealand. So maybe he's got some mail that we're not uh, aware of. He, in fact, says, and uh, this is a world you're well familiar with now, says, word on the dark web is that Ford HQ and Ford AU, together with VW money, have redesigned the front-end suspension and engine bay for V6 V8 engine to be installed and clear all compliance and regulations to make it pass for ADR. So there we were talking about ADRs, but TGV's mail is that Volkswagen wants um, capacity or the ability to put uh, other engines in there for the next Ranger. Yeah, definitely. Look, you know, it's all possible. And if we look at cars like Lego and, you know, identify what fits where, et cetera, anything's possible uh, if you think about it. But uh, it takes time to play Lego and costs money to play Lego. And it, I think it comes down to sales potential and volumes, yeah. whether also it justifies that effort. Walk on it in bare feet. It and does, yeah. Don't, yeah particularly does. on a polished Absolute floor. <laughs> or yeah. when your dog chews it up and then you, yeah, you, can't, you can't build your Defender. Exactly. Um, what are you going to do? That would hurt your dog too. <laughs> no, not at all. But um, I think all the... Conveniently uh, dishwashable. Yeah, I know, absolutely, yeah. But I, I think all of this stuff, this this R and D, is going on all the time. And I think every now and again, people will get a, a bit of a, you know, earworm about it and go, "Oh, geez, something's going on." I think it's always ticking along somewhere, like the, yeah. you know. And yeah. and I think we hear about it every now and again. Perhaps when someone wants us to hear about it, right? But, um, but yeah. I think the the flip side of that is that. There is so much going on that no one hears about <laughs> ever. Um, yeah, that people, yeah. you know, you, they're busy all the time. Look, you're right, exploring different avenues. Lots of stuff gets done. Things go to quite a, a long way down the road before they maybe don't come to fruition. There's so much that we don't know about. I think your mm. point's a, a valid one, Mel, that it, it's always going on. And the other thing we always need to remember is that Australia's right-hand drive and not many other yep. countries are. And when yep. you put V8 in an engine bay, it offers mm. a lot of width yes. and, and make, yeah. making the steering work around it quite a challenge. And if you've yep. worked it out for left-hand drive in America in a massive market, yep. it uh, doesn't necessarily work for the other side. Yes. Uh, unless you're spending the money. And, you know, South Africa, UK and Australia mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Fingers crossed we're a big enough market, but yep. Uh, yep. Mm, as, as the Holden saga has demonstrated, we're not. Uh, True. Now, um, I'm going to have a crack at this. Mont Brehain has said, please, su- pl- yeah, I beg your pardon. Uh, please, Subaru, 
please, please, please bring back the MV Brumby slash Brat. And uh, he's, look, this person is not alone. There is so much love for that car. Um, you know, and, and that talks to Hyundai coughing up with the Santa Cruz, which will be a tiny little lifestyle ute and others possibly going down that same path. Um, that is still such a popular car. It's, it's become iconic, really. Yeah. I think there's a chance we might see another one. And this may have been discussed numerous times on our site that I haven't seen. But but as we see the likes of Ford Maverick coming back and the yeah. Hyundai Santa Cruz, you know, these yeah. mid-size SUV-based utes, uh, Subaru is really good at uh, spinning variations off, uh, you know, the, the, the same sort of platform. Yeah. Look, yeah. they, and therefore they'd be ideally suited to give us a ute version of the Forester if the likes of Maverick, Maverick and Santa Cruz take off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, and they've had a go with the, the Outback, was it Outback Baja or Legacy mm-hmm. Baja in America? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which was a, a ute version of the Outback. Yeah. Um, I think the, and the Brumby occupies that, that sort of romantic realm, uh, you know, the same as the Jimny, but to a yeah. lesser degree, like yeah. people, you know, and you still see a few of them here and there and, yeah, um, you know, and, and, I, I, and enough to keep people's uh, interest in them, and the you know, and I love and, me a proton jumbuck. Yeah, <laughs> and the Suzuki Stockman. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. you know, yeah, they're, they're yeah. highly prized in rural areas. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yep. Once again, Fantastic. we'd love to see it, and it could happen. Fine. Now, our old mate De Cook says, "Do you still have both the Stonic and the Kona?" We were talking about both these cars last week as uh, cars in the garage. A comparison test would be interesting. Um, in European media, they're pitched as perfect competitors together with the likes of Puma and Kamek. Also, their prices are similar, so they're almost twins, but with bigger engines, Kona is pitched so much higher on the market here in Australia. Still doubt if the big price difference makes it worth to consider Kona. Looks like Kia outsmarted Hyundai by putting Rio on stilts just as Subaru did with XV. So with minimal investment, they potentially get a better margin off the SUV craze. What do you make of that now? I'll just say, never say that wishes can't come true because they <laughs> may come true on that. It sounds uh, like the start of a front. musical number now. And look, we, we or strive, a really bad novel. <laughs> we strive to deliver on what our uh, viewers and readers wish and watch this space coming right up. Very good. Very good. Okay, now also coming right up is Muskwatch. Muskwatch. Fine. So, uh, first of all, on Twitter, Elon has said, I bought some Dogecoin for Lil X. So it can be a toddler hodler. Now, just to decipher that, um, it's actually Elon and Grimes' little baby boy. Uh, and I, I, there's some footage of him. Here he is. You know, we've, we've got him. Elon posted uh, a little gif of him. Um, although, you know, I think poor little bugger. Although he's not actually going to be poor. I just think, wow, you're heading into a weird world here. And Is, yeah. is his name still sort of... 48 well, characters well, long and with major Android. Right? Major Android responded and said, call him by his full first name when you refer to him. Revel in your decisions. And, of course, his name is X-Ash A12. Um, that's how it's pronounced. It is- I, believe, I believe he's, and I've heard, and I have it on good authority, that his parents call him Trevor. Will, Elon calls him Lil X. Um, and Major Android says, no, nah, call him X A12. Get real. You know, you did it. Call him by his name. Um, many tweets imploring Elon to plug certain cryptos because he's still on that whole bag or telling him how cute little X is. But then Phil Taylor says, feel like giving me some money, mate. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Phil Taylor might be Australian. Um, <laughs> Brendan then said, give him some of yours, you tight git. <laughs> that was, that's a pretty good comment too. And Another take on crowdfunding. Oh, yeah, give him some of yours. You're talking, oh, yeah. And begging. Yeah, and and begging. I am, Sean says, can't believe Elon still gets away with this blatant market manipulation. McAfee got in big trouble for doing this. 
How is it okay for Elon to do it instead? Oh, because he's the richest person in the world. And that leads us to our next little tidbit where Forbes has reported that Elon Musk um, issued a serious Bitcoin, he's been issued a serious Bitcoin warning over price boosting tweets. So the thing is, Elon shook Wall Street this week when he revealed his company, which is Tesla, had bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. Um, and the Bitcoin price has surged in recent weeks, partly due to Musk's pro-Bitcoin tweets, um, at one point sending the price of Bitcoin almost 20% or, uh, higher. So now lawyers allegedly have warned Musk um, that he could be in trouble with the US Security and Exchange Commission over the facts and circumstances, quote unquote, of Tesla's Bitcoin buy. Um, you know, Really, it would not be surprising, given the focus of the chief executive's tweets, Bitcoin pricing and recent dramatic market moves, for the SEC to ask questions about the facts and circumstances here. The focus will likely be on exactly when Tesla bought Bitcoin. I think it's a classic pump up. He's been out there. He's bought, Tesla's bought the Bitcoin, unbeknownst to anybody. He's been out tweeting about how brilliant it is and making people buy. It seems to me an open and shut case, but we'll see where it goes. Can I point out from a vehicle product point of view, Hmm. At $1.5 billion that he spent on uh, cryptocurrency hmm. would be roughly the equivalent of developing an all-new platform hmm. for a vehicle. Now, Tesla makes cars that are generally spun off the same sort of architecture. Hmm. That makes me sort of, hmm, question mark, priorities of the organisation oh. if, oh, uh, yeah. oh, you know, yeah. if they're playing cryptocurrency games rather than giving us... Build- Platform. Building car games. Yeah. Well, it would, it would seem that mm. the dear leader has a gambler's instinct, you know, that he's ready to take a punt on things. And this quite literally is, you know, he's gone on a very volatile um, cryptocurrency and put big money into it in the hope that others will dive in behind him, I'm sure. And then he'll have even more money for a new platform. Holding, folding, hopefully doesn't walk away or run. Well, that's the whole toddler hodler thing. Apparently, that's a bit of crypto uh, currency trading jargon because someone in the early days of Bitcoin misspelled the word, word hold and spelled it hodl. So now that's become the language. Should I, should I sell or hodl um, rather than sell or hold? So there you go. You know, Elon's all over that as well. But wow. in, in fact, the Tesla share price is down this week by 50 bucks. Um, it's $804. A it was whole eight, pineapple. It was $854 last, <laughs> um, last week. Now, also in Yahoo Finance, I learned that Elon's younger brother has sold $25.6 million worth of Tesla shares. That's Kimball Musk. He's prone to the 10-gallon hat uh, wearing. Younger brother of Elon Musk and Tesla Inc. board member sold $25.6 million worth of shares. Um, so the Jeb Bush of that uh, family. <laughs> he's probably the Jeb Bush, yeah. He's one of the lesser Baldwin brothers. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know which one. Or a Hemsworth. Or, or Dado. <laughs> yeah, or a Dado. He could be. He's one of, one of those Dados that just operates in the uh, So oh, is, okay. that, is that the first Musk to, you know, rat leaving the sinking ship? He sold. But, it, but look, I tell you what, uh, it reduced his holding to only 599,740 Tesla shares, which amounts to $483 million. So he's still got a reasonable holding in the company. Okay, uh, right. But, uh, we'll reasonable. That goes. And with that, I think we have reached the finish line. And I want to say thank you, Crafty, and uh, thank you, Mal. Sorry, I'd mate, like I didn't catch that. that. I was just busy. Um, I was just busy trying to buy that uh, AT. You're, that you're on the crypto side. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Crafty. Thank you, Mel. And thanks. Thank you, James and Crafty. No, thank you, Mel. Thanks to our happiness. Thanks, hero, James. <laughs> Dean of Pizza and skating rink handholder, Mr. Pritchard, for his ongoing dedication to production excellence. Today he's wearing a t-shirt saying, I'm not procrastinating. I'm doing side quests. Tiger shorts and Indian Mojari wedding shoes. It is quite the ensemble. Let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. Remember, you can also watch us on YouTube. And if you are already, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel 
so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, two cops crashed their patrol car into a tree. After a moment of shocked silence, one of them pipes up with, wow, that's got to be the fastest we've ever arrived at the scene of an accident. 